Before the era of Motown and artists like Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin, there was Sam Cooke, who pioneered the creation of the soul music genre. He managed to work his way up to being one of the most significant and important figures in American music history, but it most definitely did not come without its challenges. Samuel Cook was born in Clarksville, Mississippi on January 22, 1931. He would later add the E to his last name to represent a new star to his life. He was the fifth of eight children born to Reverend Charles Cook, a Baptist minister in the Church of Christ, and Annie Mae Carroll. He was raised Baptist and his family had moved to Chicago, Illinois in 1933. He would sing in the choir of his father's church and begin his career with his siblings in a group called the Singing Children when he was six years old. From a young age, his vocal capabilities had captivated audiences, particularly in the church. He first became known as a lead singer with the Highway QCs when he was a teenager, having joined the group at the age of 14. In 1950, Sam replaced gospel tenor R.H. Harris as the lead singer of his gospel group, The Soul Stirrers who had signed with Specialty Records on behalf of the group. He was 17 when he joined. Their first record under Sam's leadership was the song Jesus Gave Me Water in 1950. They also recorded the gospel songs Peace in the Valley, How Far Am I From Canaan, Jesus Paid the Debt, and One More River, among many others, some of which Sam wrote himself. The group redefined what a gospel concert was like, and they're often credited for bringing gospel music to the attention of a younger crowd of listeners. A lot of these listeners were young women and girls who would rush to the stage when the group would perform. His tenure with the group marked a turning point in his career. Sam brought a new level of passion and energy to the group's performances, and his smooth, emotive voice quickly became their defining feature. The first disc and or collection of songs that Sam made with the group sold 60,000 copies, becoming a huge hit on the gospel charts and being played on numerous stations across the country. However, even in Chicago, there was still the undercurrent of segregation and separation between white and black Americans. But Sam was not really one to simply follow the rules. In fact, he would make it a point to do what he wanted regardless of what others had to say about it but he would also find himself receiving stares from those within his own community after turning the gospel world on its head, especially after having a child with his high school sweetheart, Barbara Campbell, out of wedlock. Barbara would stay behind raising his child while he and his group members would hit the road driving from city to city on their tour. While on these tours, they were treated quite nicely by those in other black communities since they were gospel artists, and they were, quote, serving God, is what many individuals would say, as opposed to the secular artists that were said to have been serving the devil. They also toured continuously on the Chitlin circuit like many other black artists that had become prevalent around this time. They would of course find themselves in southern cities at times and the rules in the 50s and 60s were quite different and a lot stricter than what Sam was probably used to in Chicago. There were only two cities in the south at the time that provided accommodations for black Americans. Other times they would have to sleep in their cars which would be rough in the winter time, as you could imagine. But Sam still found ways to break some of the rules. His personal life didn't quite fit the image that people had in mind when it came to a preacher's son. He now had a daughter named Linda with Barbara, but had been avoiding marrying her for an entire year, just to announce that he had actually married another woman by the name of Dolores Mohawk. Dolores was a dancer and single mother that he met while touring through California. His family had supported him, but it was most definitely an unexpected announcement. With this coming as a big surprise to them, Sam had decided to keep his musical endeavors somewhat private. His first pop slash soul single was Lovable in 1956, which was a remake of the gospel song Wonderful, and he had released the song under the name Dale Cook instead of his own. Instead of singing gospel music about the Lord, Sam was now singing about things like romance and love. There was a big separation between the gospel and secular world at the time, and those that chose to cross over could face major backlash. No one that knew his voice prior to this release was fooled into thinking it wasn't him, even though he used his brother's name instead of his. Even though the song didn't become a hit, it opened the door for so much more. He decided to step away from the gospel world to really make a go at a career in the mainstream music industry, but the decision wouldn't go over so well with his reverend father at first but he'd eventually give his blessing. Sam had become a big name in gospel, so he had gotten quite a lot of flack for moving away from it, but he was restless. 
At the age of 25, he now wanted to expand his reach and break into the lucrative world of secular music, where he could reach a broader audience and possibly have a career that paid more. He believed that he would bridge the gap between sacred and secular music, combining the emotional intensity of gospel with the broader appeal of rhythm and blues. By 1957, his marriage to Dolores had ended, and the breakup was said to have been painful, but he pressed on with his musical endeavors. He signed with Keen Records, and it was here at a very pivotal point in his career that he wrote and recorded the infamous song, You Send Me, released as the B-side of Summertime. To say the song did well would be an understatement. It spent six weeks at number one on the Billboard R&B chart and also had mainstream success, spending three weeks also at number one on the Billboard pop chart. He went from making $200 a week to over $5,000 a week, equivalent to around $54,000 today. It was an easygoing, dreamy, and somewhat weightless song, which was quite different from other popular songs from black artists at the time. He would make his rounds amongst the TV networks and shows, making it an even bigger hit. Sam was now pioneering a style of music that spoke to both black and white audiences. Soul music, as he might have envisioned it, was rooted in the black experience, but was also universal in its appeal, dealing with themes of love, loss, and hope that resonated across racial and cultural lines. Because Sam was black, it seemed to be the reason behind the charts labeling the song as R&B at first, but it was far from it. This was now new territory for a black artist, and there would be many artists that would follow behind him. He became somewhat of a forerunner for the musical crossover. In the spring of 1958, he would be given the chance to perform at the famed Manhattan nightclub Copacabana. Leading up to this point, he had been performing on TV shows like I mentioned, and in theaters like the Apollo, but this was, at the time, the pinnacle of the entertainment world. However, the club's strict no-black guest policy made Sam deeply uncomfortable, but he would still go ahead with it, with hopes that it could give him an edge. But after the performance, there were some critics saying that he was not ready for the type of clientele that came to the club. Black artists like Nat King Cole, Sammy Davis, and Ella Fitzgerald had performed there before him, but this was the first time they had a contemporary artist perform on their stage. By the middle of 1958, Sam had now been experiencing a popularity among both white and black listeners that one could say was almost on the level of admiration, and in many cases, was on that level. No artist before him had really managed to earn such a broad appeal, bridging a divide in more ways than one. At this point, he decided to go on a tour back through the South, singing both gospel and pop songs with some of his old friends. He was able to reminisce on the past, experiencing the electric atmosphere of the Pentecostal church once again. But things would change shortly after Sam would have a brush with death. He had recently purchased a brand new Cadillac car, and while in Mississippi, he had his friend Eddie Cunningham drive while he sat in the passenger seat, along with his guitarist Cliff White and the singer Lou Rowles in the back. They got into a collision with an 18-wheeler truck, and it was honestly a miracle that anyone survived. Eddie would unfortunately lose his life, Cliff and Lou would be hospitalized with some nasty injuries, but Sam would come out basically unscathed with just some glass in his eye. This would become the moment that would make Sam start to look at life beyond just music. He now found himself getting involved in the civil rights movement and wanting to make a stand against Jim Crow laws, along with those that were now fighting back against them as well. When he was preparing to perform at the first ever integrated show at the Atlanta fairgrounds, the promoter of the event had informed Sam that the KKK had made threats against his life, but Sam decided to still perform and the show went on without any problems. Just a little while later, however, he would receive the news that his ex-wife, Dolores, had passed away in a car collision in Fresno, California in 1959. This would lead him to seek solace in Barbara, but also in his family, whom he had begun to mend things with as they had become estranged over the years. He continued his tour throughout the South, and when he passed a group of prisoners working on the side of the road one day, he was moved by the image and it marked the beginning of a new direction for him. He began reading more and becoming more knowledgeable about his black heritage. He would go on to write the song Chain Gang, inspired by what he saw. Sam also pursued things on the relationship front with the mother of his child, Barbara. After the many setbacks of their relationship over the years, he finally proposed to her in 1959, and they would be married that same year, later moving in together into a home in Hollywood Hills. They would also welcome their second daughter, Tracy, shortly after. 
Even though he loved Barbara, he felt like he also owed her in some way because their first child, Linda, had been born out of wedlock. And he made her a promise that this would be it for him and he wasn't going anywhere. Now with a growing family to support, he approached his work life and goals with a different intensity. In addition to his musical innovations, Sam would become a trailblazer in the business side of the music industry. This being at the time when black artists were often exploited by record labels, he recognized the importance of financial independence and creative control. Many black musicians in the 1950s and 60s were signed to exploitative contracts that paid them a fraction of the profits generated by their work. Sam, however, was determined to break this cycle. In 1959, Sam founded Saw Records with his manager and business partner, J.W. Alexander. It allowed Sam to produce and release his own music, as well as to sign and promote other black artists. Under Saw Records, he helped launch the careers of artists like Johnny Taylor, Bobby Womack, and the Valentinos, providing them with the opportunities that would have been difficult to obtain through traditional record labels. He wrote songs like When a Boy Falls in Love, which was a guaranteed hit, and gave it to one of his aspiring artists on his label, Mel Carter. Sam's business acumen didn't stop there. He also founded his own music publishing company, Cags Music, which ensured that he retained the rights to his compositions. In an industry where black artists were routinely denied ownership of their own work, his insistence on controlling his intellectual property was groundbreaking. This move set a precedent for future generations of black artists who would follow his lead in demanding greater creative and financial autonomy. While doing all this, he would also have a string of hits throughout the late 1950s and early 60s, including songs like Wonderful World, Cupid, Twistin' the Night Away, and Bring It On Home to Me. He was managing to balance a business and also be an artist, which is something that I can't say has been successfully done by present-day artists. In 1960, Sam had signed a $100,000 record deal with RCA Records, worth over $1 million today. But now the question was, what's next? His business ventures reflected a broader shift in the mindset of black artists during the civil rights era, being more than just entertainers. Artists like Sam saw themselves as entrepreneurs, community leaders, and agents of social change. By establishing his own label and publishing company, he not only ensured his own financial security, but also created a platform for other black artists to succeed on their own terms. The civil rights movement had been beckoning to him, and in 1963, at the urging of the NAACP, Sam and his friend, the late and great Aretha Franklin, refused to appear at a segregated concert hall in Memphis, Tennessee. After hearing a protest song, Blowin' in the Wind, by the then rising young folk singer Bob Dylan, Sam felt as though there should have been a black artist that also wrote such a powerful statement in song. He was moved by the words and decided to include it in his act. Sam was in one of his most productive periods in his life, but his family was also expanding. He and Barbara welcomed their third child, a son by the name of Vincent, back in 1961. Sam appeared to really cherish his time with his children, but his wandering eye continued to cause strife within his marriage. Six years after performing at the Copacabana Club the first time, Sam got the opportunity to go back again, but the policies had since changed surrounding only allowing in all white guests. It's quite possible that this was due in part to Sam and his fellow performers and musicians taking a strong stance against segregation since his last appearance. Sam also demanded a huge billboard of the event put up in Times Square, and because he had so much of a pull in the industry at this time, he got basically anything and everything that he was asking for. Also, now that people really knew who he was, it seemed like everybody was clamoring at the opportunity to see him perform. Celebrities like Sammy Davis and Cassius Clay, now known as Muhammad Ali, had made an appearance at the star-studded night. That night was almost a complete 180 from six years ago. Everything was well put together and running smoothly, and at this point it seemed like Sam was just unstoppable. However, things would very quickly take a turn. One day Sam's office would get a call stating that his son Vincent had sadly drowned in their pool at only 18 months old. Sam and Barbara didn't keep a cover on the pool, and Vincent at some point was around it with no supervision. The manager at Star Records would have to give the unfortunate news to Sam, and he was naturally distraught, needing space from others in his time of bereavement. Many of those that knew him had never seen Sam in such a state, and for a time it was very difficult to communicate with him. 
Shortly after this ordeal, he was back in the studio to record as he had prior commitments, and Barbara would also sometimes come in with him. They both were really struggling with the loss and their relationship had begun to get a little shaky. In some ways, he blamed Barbara for not being there for their son and he also wrestled with his own feelings of guilt. Things had become tense in the home and they did their best to avoid each other it seemed. Sam welcomed any and every opportunity to get out the house and perform. Just four weeks after his son's passing would be the march in Washington for jobs and freedom. And it would also be where Martin Luther King Jr. would deliver his iconic I Have a Dream speech. This would give Sam the push he needed and he felt led to write one of his most heartfelt songs to date, A Change Is Gonna Come, in 1963, and he would release it in 1964. It was inspired by his own experiences of discrimination. The song became an anthem for the movement. Its poignant lyrics, It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come, really captured the pain, frustration, and hope of Black America during this period. It was unlike any song he had written before. While many of his previous hits had focus on love and relationships, this song was a deeply personal and political statement. The song's impact was immediate and profound, capturing the mood of a generation that was demanding change, although Sam himself would not live to see the full impact of it. On December 11, 1964, Sam Cooke was shot and killed at the Hacienda Motel in Los Angeles under circumstances that remain controversial and unclear to this day. He had become a little more active on the social scene and started going out a lot more, frequenting a bar called Martoni's and it would be where he would meet Eliza Boyer, a woman he did not know at the time was an ex-worker. According to the official police report, he had checked into the motel with Eliza after a night out. She would later claim that she had fled the hotel room in fear after Sam became aggressive, taking some of his clothes and belongings with her. Sam allegedly, in a state of confusion, went to the motel office to confront the manager, Bertha Franklin. A physical altercation ensued during which Bertha shot Sam in what she claimed was self-defense. However, many doubted Eliza's claims considering she had run off with his clothes that had money in them. It seems to many that the story was simply a cover-up for her true intentions to simply steal money from Sam after he decided to go to the bathroom. Sam grabbed the jacket that was left behind and put it on before heading down to talk to the manager, Bertha. He thought that Bertha and Eliza were working together, so he had come across quite angry, and Bertha had shot him at very close range as she had felt afraid for her life. The coroner's inquest ruled Sam's death a justifiable homicide, but the details of the case have been the subject of much speculation and debate. Some have suggested that Sam was the victim of a setup or a conspiracy pointing to inconsistencies in the accounts given by Eliza and Bertha, as well as the fact that Sam's behavior on the night of his death was uncharacteristic of the man known to his friends and family. Etta James, a close friend of Sam's, claimed that when she saw his body at the funeral home, it showed signs of having been beaten which further fueled speculation that there was more to the story than the official account had given. Others have questioned why Sam, a man known for his composure and intelligence, would behave so erratically on the night of his death. Despite these lingering questions, no further investigation was conducted, and his death remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of the music world. Though Sam Cooke's life was tragically cut short, his influence has endured. As one of the architects of soul music, he laid the foundation for future generations of black artists, from Marvin Gaye and Otis Redding to Aretha Franklin and Al Green. His ability to fuse gospel, R&B, and pop into a new commercially successful genre opened doors for countless black musicians who followed in his footsteps. His achievements in business also had a lasting impact. By founding Saw Records and CAG's Music, he set a precedent for black artists to take control of their own work and fight for their financial rights in an industry that had long exploited them. His insistence on owning his music inspired future artists like Prince, Michael Jackson, and Jay-Z to do the same, fundamentally changing the relationship between artists and record labels. Most importantly, there was Sam's role in the civil rights movement, particularly through the contribution of his song, A Change Is Gonna Come, which cemented his place in history not only as a musical innovator, but as a symbol of the struggle for equality. His music became a voice for the voiceless, offering hope and inspiration to those fighting for justice. His life and work reminds us of the power of music to transcend boundaries, unite people, and inspire action. 
Sam Cooke forever would be considered a trailblazer and barrier breaker in the world of music. So that is going to be it for the video. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If you did, please do remember to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you have any suggestions for future videos, please do let me know in the comments and I'll catch you all in the next one.